record on this computer. Good morning, good morning, everyone. I was trying to find another solution without the green screen for the slides, <clears throat> but it's gonna require me to redo all my slides so that I have room to stand next to them and project them uh, next to me. Uh, and I didn't have time to do that uh, for these slides today and it might take a lot of work. Um, so we'll see, um, either use the green screen again next time or I'll do this other method with a white screen essentially, um, be just the wall behind me and my slides projected next to me. Um, in any event, um, I hope most of you are uh, on to the homework. I saw a lot of messages yesterday and some messages uh, kept coming in today. Um, I understand the urgency, um, but I also want you to understand that for us, for me to be able to respond to you in a timely manner, you gotta give me some time. You gotta give me some notice. I, um, you know, I, I, I would love to drop everything and just answer each one of you, but that becomes an inefficient use of my time and, and your time really, because you have to start early on on the homework, please start early yeah. on. This gives us at least like, you know, half a day, let's say not, not, not even a business day, just half a day chance to say, oh, you know, someone sent me an email and I can um, respond. Um, and remember the Piazza and the, the emails we get regarding homework, we have a rotating clock, the TAs check, check most of them. And in the time I'm not writing proposals or preparing lectures, I hop in and uh, look at some of the messages and try to address as fast as I can, okay? So I hope that's clear. Get started on your homework early, a little bit, dabble with it. All right, so that you don't have like this crunch time in the last minute. And then you end up being frustrated with me and I end up being frustrated that I couldn't answer you in time. And then, uh, you know, you get upset with the course. And uh, anyway, it's just, it's, just, it's just not a good uh, position to be in for all of us. Okay, so I am gonna go ahead and share my screen now. My desktop too. And I'm gonna project the where we left off last time. So last time we did this um, little example in class with the, um, uh, uh, we did it by hand and I, uh, in your homework three, you're gonna have to do an example by hand. Um, please do this one on the slides by hand just to train yourself. I know it's kind of mundane and annoying. It will just do it a few times, a couple of times and you'll be set. You expect to get an example like a, a problem like that on 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 an exam. Okay, um, this would be like um, <laughs> a little bit. Um, will take some time for you to just do it by hand and then punch in the answers um, in in the online quiz. But expect something like that um, on your quiz. Now, next, I said, okay, we're gonna go ahead and do this in in Python, and I um, uh, had you download LinSolve one. Um, uh, in uh, .ipynb in Python. And I have these, the code here for the Tomas algorithm. So I'm gonna go over the code briefly. Again, I'm assuming you are getting up to speed knowledge with, in, in Python. So I'm, I'm not gonna spend time and details on how uh, code has been implemented in the past. Believe it or not, two years ago, students were asked to write this algorithm in Python. Um, from here onwards, I'm giving you the code and I'm just asking you to use it, okay? Um, I'll be asking you to use it or make a slight modification to it. Um, so it's much easier compared to uh, what's, uh, what's been in the past, relatively to the past. Now, what I've done here uh, for uh, this Tomas algorithm, now when you think about the TDMA or the Tomas algorithm, uh, what did we need, right? We needed, three, we needed three diagonals or uh, think of it this way, the Tomas algorithm, the TDMA works for tri-diagonal matrices. So if you were to supply a user with a method, with a technique that solves tri-diagonal matrices, um, you could do this with by defining a function. <clears throat> I called it here Tomas. And then ask yourself the question, what does this function do? It needs an input. Each function in coding 
takes an input and produces an output, right? It does something with the input internally and produces an output. So if you think of functions this way, it will help you define functions in Python when, you, when you're thinking about function, functions. There is no unique um, way to define a function. Different uh, developers define functions in different ways, depending on the input and the desired output, okay? And, and we'll see more examples on that. But, but here for the Tomas algorithm, um, if you were to supply, if I were to give you, um, as Professor said, I want to give you a function that solves tridiagonal matrices. What is the minimum set of inputs that is needed for that function to solve the system of equations? If you think about it, we need the upper diagonal, the main diagonal, the lower diagonal, and the right-hand side. That's the minimum set of information that is needed by the TDMA algorithm, correct? To produce a solution. And then once you give those to the, um, uh, to the function, once you give this information to the function, it is expected to produce a, um, an answer, okay? And that's exactly how I defined my uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas functions. I'm hoping you're seeing my, my cursor over here. So I declared the function using the definition def, which was covered in the Python slides. Thomas is the name of the function and it takes four arguments. We call those arguments. Um, I call these L, L underscore, D underscore, U underscore, and B underscore. You can call them whatever you want. You can call it uh, spell it out lower, dia main diagonal, whatever you want. These are just dummy variables. But once you provide those to the function, inside the function, you're going to be working with those inputs. Now, compared to the slides last time, I made a slight modification to the code uh, um, for purposes that I'll explain in a second. Um, so the first thing I did was do a deep copy, what I call a deep copy of L, D, U, and B. The reason is that if you look at the Tomas algorithm on the right here, the mathematical formulation, we are modifying L, D, and, and U, and B on the spot. So whatever comes in is being modified and manipulated. And therefore, at the end, all of the values of what came in changed, okay? Now, what if you, are, you created a diagonal, um, you're, you're solving a tridiagonal system, you created upper, main, and lower diagonals, Okay, and then you pass those to the Tomas algorithm without making a copy of those. The Tomas algorithm is gonna modify lower, upper, and main diagonal. But then subsequently, let's say for some reason, you want to reuse those diagonals, let's say to solve the system exactly using a, 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 a inverse, for example, or using an iterative method. What happens then? Those diagonals have been modified. So you, you wouldn't be solving the original diagonals that you started with. You wouldn't be solving the original system that you started with, okay? So that's why what I'm doing here internally inside the Tomas function, I'm making a temporary copy. I call it L, D, U, and B. And then I'm gonna be working with those copies so that I don't touch the original, whatever came into the function in Python. Python works by a method called by reference. So whatever you pass to Python, into a function, it's not going to be local. It's, it may modify the original locate the original um, um, values that you pass to it, and that could be problematic. So you know, when you are in doubt, always make a copy of the array that you're passing. Make a copy locally, modify that copy so you don't touch the original function that's coming in. Okay. So if you think of this. You as a user are going to provide L, L um, underscore, D underscore, U underscore, and B underscore. Okay. But if you don't want those to be, to be messed with, just make a copy over here of those. Now, once I created the copy, then I do a bunch of things to, um, to run this, this algorithm. I'm going to run through those briefly, very quickly. Again, it, um, I, I encourage you to study them, to see how I was thinking about, uh, about them when I wrote the algorithm. So what I need from this, if I look at the Tomas algorithm on the right, the mathematical formulation, I need a total size, the size of the array, how many points I'm dealing with, how many, um, um, when I create the loop to go over and update um, from two to N, okay, I need N, I need that value of N. And the way I get N is simply by taking the length of the main diagonal. Remember the upper diagonal is of size N minus one, the lower diagonal is of size N minus one, N is given by the size of the main diagonal. 
And that tells you, you know, you're dealing with an N by N matrix. So once I get N, then I create a solution vector. I call it X, okay? You can call it Sol. Maybe, you know, it's simpler um, to call it Sol if you want. And I declare it as a NumPy array filled with zeros. as just an empty array with zeros. And in that array, I'm gonna start storing values for the solution. And then I, I put my two steps. In step one, I'm gonna loop from two to N, okay? But in Python, I'm gonna loop from one to N minus one because Python is zero based, not one based. So the first index in an array in Python is always zero instead of one. So what I need to do with, from the mathematical algorithm is everything by negative one. So instead of going from two to N, I'm gonna go from one to N minus one. And I accomplish this with, um, range, with the range function. So I say for I in range one to N, so that gives me a counter one, two, three, et cetera, to N minus one. And then I simply apply the formula from the Tomas algorithm. I say di is equal, new di is equal to the old di minus ui minus one, li minus one over di minus one, right? And then the same thing for bi, it's just simply the math, okay? And then for step two, it's the mathematical algorithm is telling me xn goes from uh, xn is bn over dn. But in Python, because everything is, the last index in Python is n minus one, okay? The array size is n, but it starts from zero to n minus one. So the last index is n minus one. That's why I put here x n minus one is equal to b n minus one over d n minus one. And then the same thing for this loop going from n minus one to one, I have to shift everything by negative one, okay? So I start from n minus two and I have to go to zero. Now to go to zero, remember range is open bracket at the end. So I have to go to minus one in the range. So it gives me a counter from N minus two to zero, essentially. So shifting everything by minus one. And then this would be the formula. Xi is Bi minus Ui, Xi, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I ask you to download this notebook and I'm hoping it's already there. Uh, you already downloaded that last time. Many of you have done that. Um, and we're going to do the example we did in class um, in Python. So let me open up uh, my notebook. Okay. Um, it's supposed to be called Lin Activity, Lin Solve Activity One, rather than Lin Solve One. Um, sorry about that. Okay. I'm gonna bring in my slides. So remember the last example we were doing, in the last example, we were doing the following. We were solving this tri-diagonal system. The main diagonal had two, two, minus one, minus one, upper diagonal minus three, minus one, one, and lower diagonal one, four, two, and the unknown solution vector and the right-hand side. And all we need to do now is define uh, the main diagonal, upper diagonal, lower diagonal, and the right-hand side, okay? So, and you define those very simply by creating lists. You can do NumPy arrays. It's just easier to do lists for small size problems, okay? So D is simply two, two, minus one, minus one. U, upper diagonal is minus three, minus one, one, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, Actually, this should be in linear activity, sorry, in, in lin solve activity two. I apologize about that. This should be in lin, lin solve activity two. I'm sorry about that. Okay. <clears throat> but what I need to do is um, make a copy here. So go and open up your lin solve activity two. Okay. And as we um, about copy, um, I mean, look, you don't have to do that. Actually, don't make a deep copy right? because I want to prove to you that you are changing things, okay? Don't do a deep copy. Let's just use it as is. So this defines- Professor, I have a quick question. Yes, go ahead, please, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to know, how do you determine the right-handed side vector that you were talking about? It's usually provided to you by the system of equations. Not, oh, it's okay, not a right, mistake. It's not, it's not a right-handed, uh, vector, the right-hand side of the equation. So the equation, whatever is on the left of the equal sign, we call that the left-hand side. Whatever is on the right-hand right of the equal sign is called the right-hand side. 
if that wasn't clear. I see. I think I just misunderstood. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, it's not a, a yeah, it's not a right-handed vector um, that might get confused with physics and whatnot. No, no, no. This is this is talking about this equation. This a x equal b matrix coefficient matrix times x equal b, and we defined that in the in the lectures um, early on. So we said, if you remember, when we were doing here. This is what we, how we define things. The coefficient matrix is A, the solution vector is um, X, and B is the right-hand side, okay? Great, thank you. All right. So this, will, this is usually given to you or it's part of the derivation process. Now, so now um, go ahead and take a, uh, let me try the breakout rooms actually. I should be able, if you all signed up with your SSO. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna, send you to your breakout rooms. I want you to take a moment, okay, to um, solve this system using the Tomas algorithm. Okay, I'll give you two minutes, all right? I'm gonna open all rooms. Professor, I realized that I forgot to do my SSO. Should I just leave and come right back? Oh, we have a lot who have not signed into SSO. Um, yes, try to do that. It's not going to let you in. Um, for those who are not, have not been assigned, um, uh, just try to work, um, on your, on your own. There's, yeah, there's a lot of, there's about 16 students who did not sign in with SSO. So, um, yeah, I'm signed in with SSO and it's still not letting me in. Okay. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah Sophia. Okay. Hmm. Is there a way to check that your it was your unit email that was um, that's that you're logged in with on Zoom? If you go on your Zoom profile, um, don't worry about that now. I I'd rather you spend time just trying to program this. We'll sort this out. Um, I'll talk to TLT Teaching and Learning um, Technologies and see what the problems might be. Okay. For now, please try, yeah, please try to just um, solve this um, yourselves, okay? Okay. All right, so I hope you're all coming back. Yeah, this breakout room is gonna give us a headache. <laughs> okay, so I, I had spelled out the solution for you in the slides, really. Um, what do we want here? We wanna define main diagonal, upper diagonal, lower diagonal, and the right-hand side factor. Um, would anyone like to volunteer and help me out? All right, I'm gonna get the wheel of uh, randomness. <laughs> Since no one is volunteering, um, we're gonna take the spin, spin the wheel. All right, Braden, are you with us? I believe I am. <laughs> I can hear you. Do you wanna go ahead and help me out with this? Sure, are we starting with the lower diagonal then? Uh-huh, okay. Let's call it lower. So. Or LD for lower and diagonal. It be, and it should be a brace, one comma four comma two end brace. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the lower diagonal, one, four, two, and then the main diagonal. Let's call it main it's diagonal. Going to be, it's going to be brace comma, or mm -hmm. brace, Two comma two comma negative one comma negative one. Okay, and then the upper diagonal is minus Once three and minus three. one. Mm -hmm. Yep, you got it. You got and it. Then, yeah, minus three minus one one. 
you don't have to tell me comma comma just uh, you know and then b is equal to minus four two nine um two and then how do we call the solution you can call to mass simply by providing it lower diagonal um, main diagonal upper diagonal and then um, i'm going to call this right hand side okay for simplicity all right and then you can say sol is equal and then print sol and then it gave me the solution of one two three four which was if you recall the solution that we derived in class over here by hand one two three four okay, which was great so now you have Last time we verified this solution using a inverse and numpy.linalgebra.solve. And now we can solve it with the Tomas algorithm. It's great reassurance that all of our um, uh, uh, solutions are similar. Now I wanna point the issue of making a deep copy to you. So what if I go ahead now and print lower diagonal? Okay, it's remained the same. If I go ahead and print um, main diagonal, look at that. It changed. Our main diagonal was 2, 2, minus 1, minus 1. But now it's 2, 3.5, 0. 0.14, and minus 15. Why is that? Because by definition, the Tomas algorithm, the way we implemented it, it's modifying di and bi. It's modifying the main diagonal and the right-hand side. So while the upper and lower diagonals didn't change, we changed the main diagonal. And now I'm gonna print the right-hand side. I'm gonna print RHS and it changed. Our original right-hand side was minus 4292. Now it's minus 44, 4.4 and minus 60. So now that's okay if you're just using the Tomas algorithm and you know, you're, you're done with it. But what if you want to reuse these lower main and upper diagonals and the right-hand side? What if you wanna reuse them? And we're gonna have a use case for that. So that's why you need to make a copy of those, um, just like I described in the slides, okay? All right, now it is time. Does anyone have any objections? Do you, uh, do you have a problem with this copy thing? I don't have a problem with it, but just a question. Would we use the diagonals in the future just to work on them with other algorithms? Yes. Thank you, Sammy. You jumped the gun like 15 slides ahead of time. So keep that thought. What your colleague is saying is that why would we have to reuse D and B? The reason is that we are going to be comparing the Tomas algorithm to different methods. And we don't wanna recreate B and D and L and R. You know, we're gonna define the matrix once, we're gonna reuse those diagonals and that matrix over and over again. So it, we better not mess that out, not, not mess that up, okay? Okay, great. All right, so now we are gonna do a serious example. We're gonna solve, um, heat transfer in a rod. And that is as close as I could get to doing a, an example that we can comprehend in this class, as close as I could get to the um, fire um, simulation problem that, I, that we saw er, earlier um, uh, in class last week. Okay, so remember we had that fire simulation with the gas, hot gases and the flame where they reverse engineered what happened to the firefighters in the San Francisco fire. Um, so this is as close as can be to that. There's gonna be some physics involved. So I'm gonna give you that background on the physics a little bit. Um, our intent is gonna be what system of equations we need to solve, okay? You're, you're not gonna worry about the physics or the derivation or any of that. But I need to explain that to you. I need to expose it, um, um, expose you to it a little bit, okay? All right, so we are gonna consider the heat transfer in a rod or in an object. So think of your wall, you know, um, like, you know, you have, I, I see Abby and um, Bailey and Adriana, you got walls behind you, right? So that wall probably is adjacent to the exterior or to another room, right? And that section of the wall 
you know, there's the drywall and there's the studs and there's the insulation and then there's this drywall on the other side. And the reason I know that is I've, is I've been involved with some construction in our basement recently during COVID. So I, I learned about all of that. And so now, now in that section of the wall, clearly as the temperatures drop on the outside, so let's say your wall is adjacent to the outside. Um, um, if the temperature drops on the outside, you're gonna have to crank up, crank up your heater a little bit, right? Because there's heat transfer going through the wall. It's either cooling your room or heating it. There's also heat transfer going through your window, right? So Abby, I can see a, uh, I don't mean to pick on you, Abby, but you're just like the first person in front of me, in front of my Zoom screen, okay? So um, there's, a, I see a glass, I see like some light coming in. So there's a window over there, right? Now, if you go and touch that window, it's pretty darn cold. Right? Why did it? Why? And in the in the summer is going to be is going to be hot. Why is that? Because there's heat being transferred through that medium. Okay. So we're going to call that thickness that object where there's a temperature on one side and there's a temperature on another side. We're going to call that a rod. Okay. It's just a one. It's just it's just like an object of infinite. Uh, you know, if you want, of infinite height, but just it's one dimensional, and it's that thickness that matters. Okay, and it's gonna look like this. We're gonna mathematically define it as a little section um, of your wall or the, you know, the glass window or whatever. And we're gonna put coordinates x equals zero at, on one side and x equal L on the other side. And we're gonna fix the temperature on, one, on, the, on the outside. Let's say this is T left, T L at x equals zero and T uh, at x equal L, it's T on the right hand side of that rod. Okay, so on the left-hand side, there's temperature. On the right-hand side, there's temperature. And those temperatures are kind of fixed, right? So when you think of it, your room is fairly at a uniform temperature, um, unless your HVAC guy, you know, is really bad. I've, I've dealt with uh, some of those. Anyway, but, you know, fairly uniform temperature. So yeah, you could safely assume that the temperature is fixed on the inside and the temperature is fixed on the outside. Definitely on the outside, there's like this huge ocean called the atmosphere. Okay, ocean of air called the atmosphere. It's gonna fix the temperature. Now, what we're gonna do, okay? So, so that's that's enough to define a heat transfer problem. And we're gonna talk a little bit later that the, the heat transfer in that situation is just gonna be a, a straight line. Okay, and you'll learn that in in heat transfer. But we're gonna spice things up a little bit, and we're gonna heat things up in the middle. So, you know, let's say your electrician made a uh, mistake and left like a thermostat in, the, in your drywall and that thermostat is heating the wall in the middle. Or, you know, you're like, you're, you have like a little stick, uh, you know, a metal rod, you're holding it on a fire, okay? So what happens, obviously in the middle, it's gonna heat up, okay? it's gonna add heat, assuming that the temperatures on the sides are in a normal standard temperatures, like, you know, um, room temperature. Okay, and then you, you know, let's say you're lighting up, you have a lighter and you light things up, okay? Now, clearly from an intuitive perspective, you know, you're gonna heat up the rod in the middle and it's just gonna, the temperature is gonna be higher in the middle than on the ends, assuming the ends are like, are, you know, not as hot as the middle, okay? Now the equation, the math, math and that, that's the physics. Now to go from physics to math, um, we use mathematical theory of heat transfer and we can deduce the following equations called an ordinate second order differential equation. We will learn about those by the end of the semester um, to describe the temperature along the rod. So clearly from what I'm showing here, the temperature varies. It starts with TL on the left and then probably climbs up to some value in the middle and then goes down to some value on the right. Agreed? Does anyone disagree with this physical interpretation? It makes sense, okay? It's just intuitive. The equation that describes this is d2t by dx squared. Okay, so t, we know now t is a function of x, the location on the bar, on the rod. At every point on the rod, there's gonna be a different value of temperature. And that temperature is gonna vary with the x location. The equation that governs the change in temperature along the rod at every point in the rod is given by this d2t by dx squared is equal minus one over k times s of x. k 
is related to how well the material conducts heat. So, you know, um, and I've made that mistake a lot of times when I um, leave my, spat my, my metal spatula in my spaghetti and I go, like, yeah, you know, I go grab it, it's hot. But if you put a wooden spatula, it's not as hot. At least if, if heat is not heating it from the bottom, if it's just dipped in water, it's not hot. Why? We say that metal has a higher thermal conductivity than wood. In other words, if you heat one point of the metal, it's gonna spread that heat faster than what the um, wood would do. A higher thermal conductivity means higher heat transfer rates. A lower thermal conductivity means lower heat transfer rates, which is good for insulation, right? So when you put air in between two glass uh, um, um, sheets in a window, why do we put air or why do we put a vacuum? Because air and va or vacuum, they have lower thermal conductivity the vacuum has a lower thermal conductivity than air. There's no particles or molecules to transfer the heat from one spot to another. Anyway, so it's described by this simple equation, okay? Now, you prob some of you are taking differential equations now, and you will learn how to solve this equation analytically. We are going to solve it pneumatically. To solve this problem on a computer, we are going to use a method called finite difference. You will learn about this again later, but I'm just going to illustrate it to you just to give you a, a, a flavor of how complex things can be. And we're just gonna get to the equations, to the system of equations, and we'll just deal with that system of equations. So the first step we do, we take um, the rod. Numerically, we cannot describe the, the, the function continuously. There is no way we can do that. We have to divide it into discrete points. So we are gonna take that rod and divide it into discrete points. We call this a grid or a mesh, okay? In this example, just for this example, we're gonna subdivide it into five grid points. We're gonna put a point on the left and a point on the right, and we're gonna place equally, equally spaced points in the middle. Okay, we show, we, you can place those points wherever you want. It doesn't matter. It's just easier to place them at equal distances between each other, okay? Now, there's a reason behind this madness. You'll be saying, like, wow, we're placing points over there. You're going to see how, how this all works. Next, we are going to say, OK, because I'm solving this discreetly, I cannot know the distribution of temperature everywhere in the rod. I'm going to want to only know the temperature at the points that I just described, that I just defined. So I'm going to go ahead and assign a temperature symbol to each of those points. At the, on the first point, I'm going to call this T0. And then the next point, I'm going to call it T1, T2, T3, T4, T5. Now, T0, we know it. It's given. That's specified by the atmosphere outside. And T right is also given. That's kind of specified by the room. OK, so we know those two values. However, for everything in the middle, we do not. Agreed? We don't, we just assign symbols to those. Now our purpose is to find equations for these points. Like how can we find these points? Like, you know, can I find an equation that says two T one equal T zero over three, for example, that's what I'm after, okay? So now we are gonna be inspired by our governing equations. We have one thing we haven't used yet, which is the governing equation. This d2t by dx squared equal minus one over k s of x. Oh, and I forgot to define s of x. I apologize. So s of x, if you look at that equation initially, uh, okay, shift um, down. Okay. Uh, anyway, so that s of x was the source, whatever heat is being generated. It's just a function of x. Okay, it says over here there's a lot of value and then and somewhere else there's no value. So think of a Gaussian distribution, for example, where there's a peak in the middle, peak of values in the middle that is adding the heat and there's nothing elsewhere, for example. That's one example for S of X. Okay, so now that we define these points, 
we are looking for an equation that governs these points so that we can solve for them. We need equations for those points. And to do that, we are gonna be inspired by the governing equation. And later you will learn that technique. But for now, for now, take this for granted. For an arbitrary number of points, n, okay, starting from t0 to tn, so sorry, this is n plus one points. Uh, for an arbitrary number of points, so on that rod, we could have put 100 points or five, or we put five here. We could have put 1,000. We could put 253, doesn't matter. For an arbitrary number of points, okay, I'm describing this in the, in the lower set from zero to Tn. Okay, at any point in the middle, at any point I, so this is a representative point. I can be two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever, okay? At any point I, I'm claiming that we can convert this equation to the following. At any point I, if you take this equation and apply that equation at point I, you can convert that equation into a relation between the unknown temperatures at I plus one, at I and at I minus one. In other words, I have now an equation Remember, I said I'm looking for an equation for T21, T2, T3, T4. Could be T1 equal T0 over three. But this is my equation. It's actually saying Ti plus one equal, uh, Ti plus one minus two Ti plus Ti minus one equal minus delta X squared S of Xi over K. There's a reason why I put things in this order. So for example, for point one, what is the equation? At point one, I is equal one, okay? So Ti minus one would be T0. For I, for I, for Ti, it's T1. And for I plus one is T2. So you get T0, you apply that equation at I equal one. Then you can apply this equation for I equal two. What do you get? T1 minus two T2 plus T3 equal minus delta X squared times SX, uh, SX2 over K, okay? Now, you, are you starting to see a system of linear equations? Abby is nodding, she's like, and she's smiling. This seems like this is an aha moment, right? So, okay, since you're smiling, Abby, do you wanna tell me what are the unknowns in this system of equations? So your unknowns are gonna be um, your T1 and T2 in the first one, and then T1, uh -huh. T3 in the second one, and then T2, T3, T4 in the next yeah. one. Yeah, so like, yep. Exactly, and they're kind of shifted, and you can see the tridiagonal structure. But we're gonna get to, we're gonna get to that. But like Abby said, now okay, I'm looking at these equations. I know which ones are which values are the unknowns. So these are the x and y, or x one, x two. We described before. We're calling them here t one, t two, t three, right? And the first equation t zero is known because it's given to us. T one and t two are unknown. We want to use these equations to solve for t one and t two. Now on the right-hand side, do we know everything on the right-hand side? Yes, because delta X, we defined what delta X is. We, we took the length of the rod and we spliced it into however many intervals we wanted, four, three, five, 50 intervals. So we know what delta X is. We know what K is, that's the thermal conductivity. And S of X, do we know it? In general, yeah. We know what is heating the rod. So I know what S of X is, or how S, this source term, we call this source term, this heat source, we know how, I, I, we, def, we can define it, we know what it is, we can measure. Now, what do we mean though by S of X1 and S of X2, et cetera? We need to define X1 and X2. It's very easy to do that. If you know Delta X, okay, if you know what delta X is, and we know how to get delta X. So if L equal one, for example, and um, we wanna divide this rod into five intervals. So count with me, we got one, two, three, four, five intervals. We know that delta X is one over five. Okay, and then from that, we can do X zero is zero. X one is this location, it's X zero plus delta X, okay? And X2 is X1 plus, two, plus delta X. X2 is equal to two delta X. X3 is X2 plus um, delta X, which is three delta X and so on and so forth. Okay, so we know what the X values are. And then simply, 
um, then we're going to apply S of X to those values. Remember, we know S of X continuously. We want to now apply it discreetly. Now, how do you do these X locations in Python? There's a function in Python called linear space. That's, that's similar to lint space in MATLAB, if you know MATLAB. It simply takes a distance and divide it, divides it into um, a, a fixed number of intervals. Okay? So in Python, this is provided by NumPy. So here's an example of how I would create five intervals using lint space. Okay, L equal one, I define L equal one, number of points N equal five. And then I simply declare a new variable, I call it X. And I call, I, I define X as numpy and P dot lint space, starting from zero to L. And I want that lint space to divide it into five intervals. Okay. Five intervals. And it's gonna give me zero, 0.25, 0.5, 0.75 and one, one, two, three, four, five. Sorry, n is gonna give me, um, I made a mistake here. n is gonna give me um, the number of points, apologize. n is gonna give me the number of points. To get the number of intervals, you need n plus one. You need n plus one. So instead of zero to l, uh, this is giving you n points rather than n intervals. If you think about it, we have how many intervals here? We have one, two, three, four, five intervals, but how many points do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six points. So lin space is not gonna divide by the number of intervals, it's gonna divide by the number of points. It's gonna divide it into this, however many points you want. So to get the five intervals, we need n plus one over here. Um, this is a mistake on my end. I'm going to correct it right here. And plus one. So we should get zero, 0 0.2, and 0 0.4, and 0 0.6, and 0 0.8, and one. Okay. There you go. And when in doubt, um, what did I say last time? Print it out. Yes. When in doubt, print it out. Okay. So this gives us, um, uh, just, just be clear what you mean by n. Do you mean by n the number of intervals or the number of points? Okay, just be clear about that. So here we used n as the number of intervals. Typically, as we move on, I use it as the number of points. So I'm gonna change this definition a little bit. Okay, so now that we know the x values, the source s of x can be evaluated directly on these, grid po on these discrete grid points. Remember, we defined s of x as a continuous function, could be e to the minus x squared. So if I give that function, the value of x is gonna return a value. Excuse me, so this is what we, how, we, how we would do it then. We would take s of x and apply it simply to the x values, to the discrete x values that we have. So for example, if s of x is e to the minus x squared, then s1 would be s of x1 would be e to the minus x1 squared. Right, you're just simply applying that function to those points. S2 is S of X2 and so on and so forth, okay? Now, how would you do this in Python? It's pretty simple. You might be inclined to take the function and then define it for X1 and then X2. What if you, what if you had a thousand points? Do you wanna type it for a thousand times? Doesn't make sense. Python is great for things like that. Because now that we have X as a linear space, as an array, all I have to do is pass that array to the exponential in this case, and it's gonna produce an array evaluating that source term at every point X. So in other words, if I provide the function e, of, e to the minus X squared, if I provide it with an array for X, it's gonna return an array of S1, S2, and so on. We're gonna exercise this uh, in, in a little bit. I'm just kind of collecting all the, all the points together here. And this is how you would do it in Python. First, I define my source term. In this case, I'm defining, I change it a little bit. I define it as 0 0.01 uh, numpy dot exponential of minus x minus 0 0.5 times x minus 0 0.5, okay? So that's similar to x squared shifted to the center. And then L equal one, N equal five. I define my lint space X 
And then I call my function source on that X. And it's gonna return to me a bunch of values. Then I print S, it's gonna return a bunch of values. What are those values? This is gonna be S at you know, X zero, S at X one, S at X two, S at X three, S at X four. Okay, that's how you do it. Okay, so now that we define the coordinates and the source terms, we can finally get the governing equations that we can understand and play with. Remember, we've only learned about tridiagonal systems and hopefully we're gonna get a tridiagonal system over here. Now, like I said, for each of the blue points, there is a linear equation that relates the temperature between the two neighboring points to the temperature at that point, okay? So for point zero, we know the value. We don't need to apply the equation to it. If we were to apply it, we would get a TI minus one, which is undefined, which is inside the world. We don't know that point. So instead we say at that point, we know what the temperature is, okay? I'm trying to scan your faces to see um, kind of who's uh, confused, who's doing all right so far. Okay, please feel free to interrupt me. This can be intense and you might wanna go back and revisit these slides. But none of, mo most of what I said now is not gonna matter except for the following parts. Now for point one, I have the following equation, T zero, minus two T1 plus T2 equal minus delta X squared times S1 over K, okay? I always put, try to put the unknowns on the left-hand side and the, what I know on the right-hand side. However, I wanted to keep T0 over here, okay? Because I need a coefficient for T0. And you'll see, I wanted to make it a tridiagonal matrix, okay? For point two, this is what you get. For point three, T2 minus two T3 plus T4 becomes repetitive which is a great thing. That's, that's one of the um, um, hallmarks of these types of physics problems. You define it for an arbitrary point, you get, it just you, replicates itself for all other points. For point four, T3 is equal, you know, T3 minus two T4 plus T5 minus delta X squared, et cetera. And for point five, you get T5 is equal T right, which is exactly, uh, which, is, which we know that value. Now, again, do not worry about how these equations came about. You will learn about this when we study ODEs, but what you need to know, I'm gonna give you this structure. So I will give you the structure of equations, okay? Or I'll give you the formula and you have to deduce the um, uh, coefficient matrix from that. Now note the different form of the equations for the points near the boundary. For point zero, I have T zero equal TL. For point five, I have T five equal T right but then everything in between is kind of the same, okay? So now I'm simply gonna translate this into a, a, matrix, um, uh, a matrix system. Remember, we learned that linear systems of equations can be represented as um, matrix times some vector that equal a right-hand side. This is exactly what we have here. Now I'm gonna spit this out for you immediately. Take a moment to absorb this. My unknown vector, okay, my unknown vector is, I'm gonna say it's from T0 to T5, okay? It's from Z, T0 to T5. Now, although I know T0, I wanted to include it in the system of equations, okay? For, there are many reasons for this, for simplicity when you're plotting the solution, but notice the equation for T0, it's just telling me one, times T0 equal TL. So the solution is just gonna return T0 equal TL. So nothing has been changed for T0. Same thing for T5. If you look at the last equation, which is the last row, everything is zero except T5 is equal to TR. Now everything in between, you see what, um, what Abby was just saying, that you get this kind of staircase, this tridiagonal structure. For equation at point one, for the equation at point one, you get T zero, so one times T zero minus two times T one plus T two equal to minus delta X squared times S one over K and so on and so forth, okay? Now, if you forget, we started with this 
mathematical equation and we ended up with a system of linear equations. And this is how it's done in real life. These simulations that you see, they end up solving, converting the governing equations, which are a hundred times more complex than this. They are partial differential equations in different directions in space and they have a time component. Okay, so there are, it's a four dimensional problem, time and three dimensions in space. And yet they all result in systems of linear equations like this. The reason I chose the 1D problem is that the 1D results in a tridiagonal structure so that we can use the Thomas algorithm. When you go to 3D, it becomes uh, more complicated than that. And there's no standard algorithm for that. Okay. So it turns out that we can write these equations in matrix form. And that's what's gonna matter to you. What you should take from this is what the matrix looks like, okay? Forget now about the equations. If I add a thousand points in the middle, they're all gonna look the same. The first point is gonna be one. The last point in the matrix is gonna be one. And then I'm gonna have one minus two, one, and then zero, one minus two, one, and then zero, zero, one minus two, one, zero, zero, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see these three dots repeated over here. These three dots mean you're just repeating that value. So the main diagonal looks like one minus two, 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 however many points you have. Okay. And then one. The lower diagonal is one, 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 one. Last point is zero. Upper diagonal starts with zero. And then one, 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 one to the end. And then the unknown vector goes from zero to Tn minus one. So I corrected the nomenclature for n points. Okay, we have n points. Your t is gonna start from t zero to t n minus one. Okay. And then your right hand side is also repetitive. First point is t l, last point is t right. And in the middle, it's always minus delta x squared times s i over k. So times s one over k times s two over k times s three over k, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I have the animations messed up here. So if the rod were to be subdivided into n points or n minus one intervals, that's easier to think about, the matrix would look like the following. And then your job, so when I, when I'm gonna give you the structure of the matrix in, in problems. I'm gonna tell you, okay, the matrix looks like this or the formula looks like this. You know, you might have a different number at the, if you, if you use a different discretization method, you might get slightly different coefficients in the coefficient matrix, but they're repetitive. That's the point. Okay. But in your homework, I'm, I'm going to give you this matrix essentially, and you're just going to have to implement this in Python. Now the question is, how do we do this in Python? Okay. Professor. One thing to, yes, yes. I have um, a quick is, question. Who is speaking, I can... just, a, just a little bit, mm -hmm. but um is this uh, jace yeah yes this is jace yeah um, yeah could you explain again why the values are one negative two one like the positions so the top upper um upper diagonal is zero ones right can you explain why it's a zero why it's a one so don't and think of the diagonal. One. don't think of diagonals think of the matrix take the following okay. into heart Whenever you see a matrix, it describes a system of equations. Forget about, for a moment, forget why the matrix looks like that. The, the fact that the matrix looks like that is a result of how the equations were written. But I want you to think okay. about the equations first. Forget about the matrix. So in the, on this slide, I'm showing you the equations. Now we agreed that these are the equations governing the heat transfer in our rod. At the first equation at point zero is T zero equal TL. Okay, forget about matrix now. And then for the, for the first point, you get T0 minus 2T1 plus T2 equals something, okay? Think of this as the X1, X2, X3, okay? And then so on and so forth. Now, if I were to ask you to write this as a matrix in, in matrix form, what would you do? The first thing you do is you define your unknown vector. And that unknown vector, we're gonna start with T0, and I, I'm asking you to start with T0, although you know T0, but there are some benefits to, to keeping it part of the solution. It's not gonna matter because we get T0 equal TL. It doesn't make a difference. But think of it as this way. You first define your unknown solution vector. What are you trying to solve for? 
I'm trying to solve for T0 to T5. So you write that vector over here. You see my cursor? Okay, yeah. you see this? So you write the solution vector. Now you start building the matrix. And how do you build the matrix? One row at a time. The first row describes to the first, this corresponds to the first equation. And the first equation is simply one times T0 plus zero T1 plus zero T2 plus zero T3 plus zero T4. That's why you get all those zeros, right? So mm -hmm. one times yeah. T0 equal TL. Now the second equation, what do you do? You get one times T0 minus two times T1 plus one times T2 plus zero times T3 plus zero times T4 plus zero times T5. Okay. And that's why you yeah, get one yeah. minus two, one, zero, zero, zero. Now the next equation, you moved one point to the right. So you've really moved those coefficients. You've circ you've taken that second row and rotated it just one point, and then you keep moving. Yeah. Does okay, this help? That makes sense now. Thank you. Yeah, that helped okay. a lot. Thanks. Yeah. Think of the matrix as a system of linear equations. Don't before you look at the structure. Why is my diagonal like that? Who cares? The diagonal is like that because you wrote the governing equations like that. Okay. Now this is cool. desirable for us because we want it. It's good that it is tridiagonal. Okay. All right. So now that we know Sorry, the general I'll... form, yes. Sorry, I just had another quick question. Um, I'm just having a hard time. I always get confused with the n minus one parts. Uh, where it... so I'm just confused why it wouldn't be t n equals t r in the matrix. Why? I guess, why is it Tn minus one equals Tr? It doesn't matter. I define the matrix, it doesn't matter. I define the matrix for n points I, because n points is easier than n intervals, et cetera. Forget about intervals because when you're plotting, you want to plot over points. You want the temperature over the points, right. not the intervals. So I redefined everything as n points. For n points, because, and I'm going to be using Python indexing starting from zero rather than one. So I'm going to go from zero to n minus one for n points, rather than from one to n. Just okay. simple, so simple I'm, shift. Okay. Okay. So I'm just confused then with like the diagram. So we're starting with t equal like with this matrix in this diagram. We're starting at t equals zero, um, and then we're going to t not t five. equals zero. T t zero is t l. Oh, sorry. Right. Yeah. T zero is t l and. Over here, five is just an example for n, you know? Okay, yeah, I just clicked, yeah, sorry. So, for n. so really, here you have six points in this example. Right. Yeah, six points, and the last point is n minus one, which is t5, okay? Okay, great, that clicked, thank All you right. so much. Okay, so now we, okay, it's one thing to deal with the um, small matrices, and we could, we're able to put d equal minus two, minus two, one, one, like in the previous example and whatnot. It's another when you're dealing with large matrices like this. So clearly, if I have more points on this rod, I'm gonna get a more accurate solution, correct? That should be obvious. I have more points in this rod. So I wanna be able to solve this system for any number of points I want. And therefore I need a mechanism that allows me to program this matrix in Python very efficiently. Not have to worry, oh gosh, now I have to do it for 150 points. I'm gonna reinvent the wheel. No, we're gonna need a quick mechanism that allows us to program this matrix for an arbitrary number of points very effectively. Now, luckily, most of the entries in these um, matrices are, sim are the same. So the upper diagonal, it's all one except for the first point. The second diagonal, it's all minus two, the main diagonal, it's all minus two, except for the first and last points, correct? And the lower diagonal, it's all one except for the last point. Now, if you think of this, you ask yourself, is there a way in Python to just create an array? If we were to able to create an array of ones, suppose that, suppose that's the case, an, ar an array or a list of ones for the upper diagonal, a list of twos for the lower diagonal and a list of ones for the, sorry, for the main diagonal, list of twos and a list of ones for the lower diagonal. Multiply the main diagonal by minus, so you get minus two. And then fix the first or last points as needed. Wouldn't that be great? Turns out, yes, we can do that exactly with NumPy. NumPy provides a function called ones. 
just like numpy dot zeros creates an array of zeros and zeros we can use numpy dot ones it creates a list or an array one dimensional array of ones of size n so when you call np dot ones of size n is going to create a vector of values one and values of one so ones three it's going to return to me one 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 three times ones five is going to return to me one 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 five times right so then we can use that to create non-trivial diagonals and that's what matters for the thomas algorithm it's just those three diagonals and the right hand side correct so this is exactly what we're going to do for the main diagonal we can take np dot ones n times multiplied by minus two as the first line over here shows so it's minus two times np dot ones i used five you can use whatever n it doesn't matter but we used five just for simplicity here it's going to give me minus two minus two minus two minus two minus two now obviously i need to fix the first and last points so I go and say D at zero, the first entry in D, this first entry, I want it to be equal to one. So what that does, it changes this vector into one minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two. Now I need the last entry. You could say D N minus one equal one, or you can use a cool trick in Python where you can index from the back so when you we use indexing d0 d1 d2 you're indexing forward but if you use a negative index you can index from the end so d minus one is going to give you the 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 location of the last entry in the matrix okay and the vector and i have a typo over here this should be one i think this should be one okay let me fix this i'm gonna play this again Okay, you see what I've done here? D of minus one, that gives me the last entry, this guy over here, this last minus two, and I change it to one, and there you go, you got your array. Now, this is easily generalizable for any matrix size. Okay, and here's a code. From NumPy, import, um, so forget about Diag for a second. So these were all slides. And we will get, we're gonna go ahead and implement this together right now. We have about 15 minutes, so that's gonna be enough time to, to go through this example. From NumPy, import ones, so that I don't have to call np.ones all the time, but you can do that. Um, n equal five, choose whatever number of points you want, could be a thousand, could be 15, you know. And then I create my main diagonal, minus two times one, ones of size n so that's going to give me five ones i multiply them by minus two gives me five minus two values and then i fix the first value and i fix the rest value for the upper diagonal what do we do we do the same thing but the size of the upper diagonal is n minus one right because it's less one less one element less so we create the upper diagonal it's all ones of size n minus one in this example it's four four ones and then we fix the last value because remember the upper diagonal uh sorry we fix the first value the upper diagonal is zero one 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 okay and same thing for the lower diagonal we create it as all ones and then we fix the last value l minus one is equal to zero Okay, nothing works best than getting our hands dirty. I wish to give you, a, I hope, I, I wish I could give you a break, but we're running out of time and we really need to, this, to do this exercise before your homework, okay? So we are gonna create a new Python notebook together. I want you to go ahead and do the same thing. We're gonna do import NumPy as MP. That's the first thing we want to do. Okay, so now I'm going to try to solve this heat transfer problem. Let me see where my slides are. We're going to try to solve this heat transfer problem and make some plots. Okay.
We're going to do import numpy um, as np and import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. Okay. Um, I will I, I will upload an activity notebook like this um, for you, but I'd like you to follow with me right now. Okay. I'd like you to follow with me. So we are going to try to solve this problem. Okay, let's say how have, how many points do you want to solve this problem for? Emily. Five points. Five points? No. Why do we do it for five points? Let's do it for Emily. Give me give us a number. A thousand. A thousand? Okay. N equal one thousand. Okay. So we started with one thousand points. Now we're gonna define L as 1.0. That's the length of the thing, of the, you know, the, the rod, okay? It's one meter long. Now, N, we said N is the number of points. So be careful, number of points. Therefore, we have N minus one intervals. Agreed? So five points, four intervals, you know, 1,000 points, 999 intervals. All right, so let's be careful about that because we need that to define delta x. Why do we need delta x? Remember, in the right-hand side, we had a delta x multiplying the source term, okay? So dx is simply L over n minus one. Agreed? That's the interval size, okay? And now we simply de define what x is. Those are like the pr primary ingredients that we need x equal mp dot lin space from zero to L. Remember, lin space needs number of points, not intervals, so we're gonna give it n. Okay, so I'm gonna do, I think Sovit suggested five, so we'll just do it for five points and print x to make sure we got the right thing, okay? So that's for five points or four intervals, this is what you get. For a thousand points, we get all of these points. Okay, now obviously it's Did gonna be hard to. Professor, in yes. this slide, there was like, you made a point that it wasn't actually N, but it was supposed to be N minus one or plus? No, so, no. so I, I, yes, I changed now. I changed my definition. I said that, and that was fixed in the last slide. I apologize about that. We, we, you have to choose what you're dealing with. Are you dealing with points or intervals? I'm claiming that it's better to eat, to deal with points. Um, I know from previous homework, previous years, many students get stuck with that. So that's why I wanted to make that kind of challenge in the distinction, okay? I like to deal with the number of points because that's what I'm finding the solution at. So as long as you work with that, the only thing you care about is how you define the interval, delta x, and then you're, that's, that's where you put n minus one and everything else you're just dealing with n, okay? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so now, I'm gonna go ahead and define a source term. Okay, I'm gonna do define source. Obviously source is a function of X and those X are gonna be discrete values. And I'm gonna declare this source as, um, I'm gonna create uh, this function, um, sigma. So don't worry about how I got this function. It's just a Gaussian function. Um, X zero is um, two over three. And then um, result, just copy what I'm doing. I'm defining the source term 0 0.2 times exponential x minus, minus x minus x zero squared. Okay, times x minus x zero over um, sigma, that's the standard devi deviation. Okay, so, so this defines what I'm doing here. Will you go through that sigma code again? How you got sigma to look like that? If you put a backslash and type a, um, a, uh, a uh, sorry, a Greek, a Greek name of a letter. So you can do backslash sigma and you, you press tab, it will turn it into a sigma. Okay, so for some of you, it might not work. Oh, so tab. just type in sigma, type it as sigma, okay? Um, but what I want to do here is here, we are defining the source. Um, so begin equation, 
then end equation. So the source is S of X is equal to the to 0 0.1 times E to the power uh, minus X minus X zero squared over Sigma, oops, Sigma squared. Okay. So that's what I'm defining here. 0 0.1 e to the minus x minus x zero squared over sigma squared. Okay, and then return result. So now we can simply to just make sure that you got, what, what does your source term look like? You can just plot it. So you can do, oops, you can do in a new cell, I'm gonna plot this. I'm gonna do plt.plot. You should have seen this example in the slides, in the Python slides. What am I gonna plot? I wanna plot the source term versus x. So on the x-axis, I'm gonna put the x that we just computed and the y-axis, I'm gonna put source of x. And this is what you get. So this is heating the rod slightly towards the end of the rod at two, specifically at two over three. Okay, that's what this x zero says. If I change this x zero to one over two, it's gonna heat it at the center. If I change it to one over three, it's gonna heat it on the left-hand side. Okay, that's what the X zero is. Anyway. Now we can start working on our problem, okay? So I'm, I'm running short on time. So now I'm gonna start defining all the parameters for my function, for my, um, uh, for my uh, equations. TL, which is T left, I'm gonna call it, it's 300 degrees, let's say. And T um, right is, let's say again, 300, okay? And then the thermal conductivity, standard thermal conductivity is 10 to the minus five. Now here's what I need to do. Here's the critical part of where um, defining these matrices becomes important. Okay, so I'm just gonna replicate this, okay? I'm just gonna replicate this. The main diagonal is minus two times one of size N and fix the initial point and the last point. Same thing for the upper, fix the initial point and for the lower, fix the last point, okay? So that gives us our entire coefficient matrix, okay? So, and you can print those. So you can print, for example, um, Okay, I didn't import ones, so I'm gonna do np.ones over here. Now, if you print D, it's all, it's minus two, minus two, minus two, and then one, and then one. There's a thousand of these values, okay? If you print the upper diagonal, it's gonna be zero, and then one, 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 one everywhere. It's always good to print. Don't print with 1000 points, print with like 10 maybe, just so that you're not overwhelmed, okay? <clears throat> okay, so now we can, we need to build the right-hand side, okay? We didn't talk about that, but we kind of know what we need to do for the right-hand side. So the right-hand side, again, is the same story. Everywhere it's minus delta X squared times S over K, okay? except for the initial and last point. So here's what I'm gonna do. So if you think of it, uh, why did you go window? Okay. So let's do the right hand side. We're gonna call it RHS is equal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the, the predominant term and then I'm gonna fix the endpoints. So the predominant term is minus dx squared so that's minus dx times dx times S1, S2, 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 etc. How do we get that? Remember what we just did upstairs, up there, not upstairs, <laughs> up over here. Source of x, simply source of x. That is gonna, because source x, what does it store? It contains S0, S1, S2, S3. We just covered that over here. You see this? 
we stored S0, S1, S2, S3, and so on. So that's what it will return. That's what this will return. We need to divide it by K. And then I need to fix the first and last point. RHS0 is the first point. I need it to be equal to T left. And RHS um, minus one, the last point, I need to be equal to T right. Okay. Give you a moment to type this up. I have four more minutes. So is RHS automatically an array? Of course, yes. So let's do it for 10 points, okay? So I can print it, print RHS. So if your function is standard using standard NumPy exponential and NumPy functions, if you give it an array, it's gonna return an array where it applies the function pointwise, okay? Now we need the Tomas algorithm. So go ahead and copy your Tomas algorithm from wherever um, you, you have it. Who is behind? Okay, Marta, can I help you? How can I help you? Yes, probably. I've got an error. Um, you wanna sh I can sh let me see if I can share my screen. I have to unshare my screen first. Oh, then never mind. Um, um, it just do you trace, trace back most recent call last? Okay, where at? Where at? What at? What point? In if you look after, at my code. Um, yeah, after your line twenty four. I don't have the plot. Okay, so. Did you import matplotlib? Um, yes. Okay, and then you say plt dot plot parentheses. Yes. You got x and source of x, and you defined source previously, and it looks like that. Um, yes, almost. So I can spend time with those who didn't make it. I can spend time after class. How about that? Like this way, we can okay. share. Thanks. Your screen, yeah. So, uh, sorry about that, um, but I can spend time with you after the after the, after the lecture. Okay, so if you've got your Tomas algorithm, I mean, this is the punchline now. We want to solve this system, right? So what do we do? Solution, or you know, temperature, temperature, or um, solution. Let's call it solution. Equal Tomas. What do we give it? We're gonna give it. L, D, U, and RHS. It did something. You can print it, but it's better to plot it. PLT dot plot. We're gonna plot the temperature versus X. X solution. And this is what you get. On the Y axis, you're seeing the value, the solution value or the temperature and on the x-axis, your location on the rod. And as expected, you start, what, at about 300. So let me add a grid. Okay, you start at about 300, at exactly 300, you better, because that's the left point. And you go up because you're heating the rod up to 650 or so, and then you go down where to? 300, the right point, okay? So let's say now you want to start verifying and playing with this. What if I change the right-hand side to 350, the right temperature? My solution is going to go up, but it's going to go down to 350. So let's see if it does that. I run it again. Okay, look at that. Left is at 300, it went up, and then went down to 350, as expected. Okay, now let's do 1,000 points. This was with 10 points. I'm going to run everything again. Oh, you're going to get a much smoother temperature distribution. 
you can get a much smoother temperature distribution. Okay, so let's try, what if we don't have a source? What if our source was very, very small, insignificant? So let's say in my source term, without putting zero in the source term, I'm gonna return a zero, very, very small value. Actually, let's return zero. You can get a straight line from 300 to 350. Now, if you remember your RDEs, what, does the, what is that equivalent to? It's equivalent to this equation, d2t by dx squared equals zero. The solution to that equation is a straight line. Good. That's critical thinking. What I just illustrated to you now is critical thinking. You are you can be, you want to be critical about your method. What if I change the temperature in the left on the right? I should expect, I expect to see something. Am I seeing that? If yes, good. That's good. You're matching your um, product with your intuition. Okay. I'm afraid we are going to have to stop here. Um, for those of you who are having trouble with um, Python, um, please stick around. We can share screens. Okay. I just have a quick question. I